Um, so as she said, my name is Jared Hanlon. I am an assistant professor of theater at the university. Um, I'm, uh, what she said, voice and movement. I'm considered the voice specialist, which means I teach mostly courses in uh, movement for actors, voice and articulation. Um, I teach a course in dialects. I teach a course in stage combat. Um, uh, as well as a course in uh, introductory acting for non-BFA acting majors, um, which is fun. I actually really enjoy that class. Um, so a little bit more um, about me. Um, um, so I'm originally from Crestwood, Kentucky. I am not used to this weather. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I'm from Crestwood, Kentucky, which is outside of Louisville. Um, I, uh, I, I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Louisville in theater arts, uh, it's a Bachelor of Science. Um, while I was there, I decided that um, acting was really something that I, uh, I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and I, I wanted to be in an environment that was, that was training other people to act and to, to tell human stories. Um, Checking out something in sound. Um, sorry. Um, I, I wanted to be a part of that environment. I wanted to um, to give the kind of experience that I had had uh, from my teachers, um, because they spent a lot of time. They invested in me, and they uh, they helped bring out parts of me that um, uh, that really, really got me excited about this art form and its power, its ability to tell human stories and share with, with other human beings truths about what it means to be human. That's what theater is supposed to do. Um, so uh, about partway through getting close to the end of my undergraduate work, I decided that I wanted to teach. So uh, I, I started applying to graduate schools, and I, I got my Master of Fine Arts in Acting from the University of Arkansas. So I spent three years there in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, while I was there, I did a little bit of professional work with a local uh, regional theater company called Theater Squared, um, which is uh, um, just won a, um, uh, an award from the American Theater Wing for being one of the top, uh, in, top 10 emerging theater companies in the country. Um, uh, a couple of years in a row, they do uh, a new play festival. Every year, they invite playwrights to come in and. Um, uh, I was involved in their company of actors developing these plays and then eventually performing staged readings of these plays. Um, we did that there in Fayetteville and we did it in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, so that was an experience that was really, really important to me, being able to um, help create new work. Um, I have been an, an actor for about 11 years. I started acting when I was in high school. Um, and I, I really can't imagine doing uh, anything else. I've, I've been in various different plays from Shakespeare, Moliere, all the way up to contemporary um, drama and, 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 and comedies. Um, and the, the, the breadth of experiences that you get to have in the theater, both creating and watching as an audience member, um, I think is really valuable. Um, so a little bit now uh, about the, the university and the training grounds that we have here for theater artists. Um, uh, the Department of Theater and Dance is part of the College of Fine Arts and Communications. Uh, we have 12 full-time faculty members. Uh, I'm one of them. And then we have two adjuncts in dance and two um, academic staff members, our, our scene shop and costume shop managers. Um, on the theater side, uh, we have approximately 110 majors currently. Um, so we have a, a constantly rotating company of actors and technicians and designers and stage managers. Um, they're split up between four different degree tracks. A more generalist degree um, gives you kind of a broad overview of theater and allows you to, to study other things in the university while you're there. The other three BFA um, tracks are very rigorous. They are very high credit majors. They don't give you a whole lot of time to do anything else. Um, they are considered pre-professional degrees 
you go into this track deciding you want to be an actor, you want to be a musical theater performer, or you want to be a, a, a theater designer. Um, but again, the BFA design technology, acting, and musical theater. The courses that I teach, I, I primarily spend the most time with the, the students that are BFA acting and BFA musical theater, mostly acting. Um, so we, um, 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 so as a department, we are basically our own fully functioning uh, theater company within the context of the university. And uh, we put on six to seven shows a year um, during the school year. Um, this year we're doing, we're doing six, next year we'll do seven and try to rotate that. So it's always split between two dance concerts, um, two musicals, and two to three straight plays, Crucible being, Crucible being one of the straight plays this year. Um, I thought that I was going to be, uh, there, there are six faculty members currently that are directors for the for this season. I thought that I was going to be in rotation to direct every other year. Um, and now that I know how much work it is, I kind of wish that were the case. But, <laughs> but I'm already slated to direct Antigone next year. So um, hopefully you guys, uh, if you enjoyed The Crucible, uh, those of you that have seen it, those of you that are yet to see it, um, please come back and see Antigone. Um, but um, so uh, that's the company. We these are the shows that we do are always split between two theater spaces. We have a 372 seat uh, auditorium, Jenkins Theater, which is where the Crucible is being held. Those of you that have been there already, um, and then our studio theater, which is a smaller black box space. Black box means that um, the seating arrangement is flexible, and where you put the stage is flexible. It could be proscenium. It could be thrust. Uh, with audience on three sides, it could be in the round. Um, it's kind of up to the uh, the director in that case to decide what kind of configuration they want. They have they, they aren't letting me work in that space yet. <laughs> um, but um, as a faculty, um, we we try to decide on our season as early as possible in the year for the next year. Um, there's been a push recently to, um, to really shorten the amount of time it takes for us to decide on a season so that we can start designing the productions earlier. Um, apparently in recent years, the, it gets really, really stressful leading up to opening because there are so many things that have to get done last minute, and they're trying to avoid that. Um, for this particular show in The Crucible, um, Last year was my first year teaching, um, and uh, I, I knew that I was going to have to direct the following year, so uh, they told me, come with uh, a number of plays that you're interested in directing, uh, a variety of different titles. And so uh, I brought several uh, shows forth, um, Antigone was actually one of them then. Um, uh, but The Crucible was the one that I was really, really most excited about, because it's a play that is really, really important to me for what it says. Um, about the power of fear in our society and, and how important it is that we stand up against it. As well as it being one of the plays that has been, uh, that made me want to be an actor. Um, the first time reading The Crucible um, was in high school because it was required reading. And uh, we had a wonderful English teacher. She actually had us stand up and read it like a, a stage reading in class. And I was fortunate enough to read for Proctor. So it, um, it was it was one of those experiences that made me think, yeah, I can really get into it. I can I can be another character. I can I can enjoy telling the story this way. Um, so because of that, uh, it, it was the, it was really important to me that for my first show here at the university, I, I direct a show that I was comfortable with, that I knew well, and uh, I, I could feel comfortable. Happening uh, in a new in a new environment, um, and the faculty were very very supportive of that. Um, so uh, that decision didn't get made. Our, our our season talk started in like October of 2012. We didn't actually decide on the season until March ish. Um, so it takes a long time, and we're trying to shorten that down. This year, when we just we just decided on our season, it took us to mid-February, so we're getting better, um, but it still takes a long time. Um, 
So once it was decided that I was going to do The Crucible, I then had, uh, knowing that it was going to be the first show in the spring semester, I had quite a bit of time to start digesting the play. Um, the first step as director for any show is that you just read the play over and over and over and over again. It doesn't matter that I, I have already read it several times and that um, uh, I, I did it while I was in grad school, I, I acted in it, it doesn't matter. You have to come back to it and keep digesting it because there's always something new to find. Um, so while I was um, spending these months digesting the play, um, uh, I took some time to learn about the historical context, um, both the content of the Salem Witch Trials and um, the, the context within which Miller wrote it, why he wrote it. Um, in, uh, by the early 1950s, Arthur Miller, pictured up here, um, had already achieved critis critical success on Broadway. He had earned Tony Awards uh, for Best Author for All My Sons and Death of a Salesman. Um, Death of a Salesman also won uh, the 49 Pulitzer Prize. So there at the end of the 40s, right after World War II, was when he really kind of hit his stride what's considered the Miller Trilogy, um, All My Sons, Step the Salesman, and Crucible, which came there in the early 50s. Um, in 1952, um, the acclaimed theater and film director, Ilya Kazan, um, who had directed uh, Death of the Salesman on Broadway, um, they had been friends for several years. Um, he stood before the US House Committee on Un-American Activities as a friendly witness and testified to eight former members of the group theater, uh, a prominent group of theater artists in New York at the time and still considered some of the most influential theater artists that we have in America, in American theater history. Um, he testified to them being involved in the American Communist Party. At one time, several of them had been. Um, all, a lot of the members of the group theater had been involved in that party. Um, that testimony negatively impacted the futures and the careers of all of those people. Um, he was unwilling to sacrifice his own blossoming Hollywood career um, for the cause of the Communist Party, was his, his justification. He, he would say in later years that it was the lesser of two evils. He didn't want to give up names for his friends, but he was, he was unwilling to sacrifice his own future. Um, reportedly, before he testified to the HUAC, um, he actually had a conversation with Miller about it, trying to decide whether or not he should testify. And Miller reportedly told him, um, don't worry about what I'll think. Whatever you do is okay with me because I know that your heart is in the right place. Um, which I find fascinating that he said that because after he said that, and then after Kazan testified, um, their friendship dissolved. They, they wouldn't see each other again for 10 years. And after that happened, Miller took a research trip to Salem, Massachusetts. And less than a year later, he premiered The Crucible on Broadway. Um, this was, um, um, uh, the play itself, once it premiered, it received mixed reviews. Um, and it didn't make a whole lot of money, but it won uh, the Tony Award for Best Play that year. Um, he had won Best Author before, but this was the first time he won Best Play. Um, just as a, a side note for trivia, um, if this was, if The Crucible was Miller's um, artistic statement against Kazan, um, Kazan's defense was on the waterfront. You guys know this? Um, and what's really interesting about that is that the original screenplay for On the Waterfront was called The Hook, and it was written by Arthur Miller. Um, after their friendship dissolved, um, they hired a different screenwriter. Um, so what is really, really interesting to me about this and about the fact that, that Miller really found it necessary to speak out against the, the ideological paranoia that was happening in the Second Red Scare in the early 50s um, 
was that it was both a public problem, what was happening to, to artists, what it, the, the blacklisting of the Hollywood Ten, um, anyone associated with the American Communist Party, Joseph McCarthy's list of known communists in the government, and the type of fear that was just ramping up in this time period. Miller's need to, to call that out um, was, a, was a public problem, but he had a very personal connection to it because his friend testified. Um, and I think that that is very, very evident in this play, and that's why it is as powerful as, as it still is. Um, the characters are dealing with um, hard truths and this difficult fear, um, both in the public arena in Salem and in their own personal lives. What is most pressing on Proctor's heart is the fact that his wife won't forgive him, right? Um, so, knowing that about um, the type of atmosphere that uh, Miller was in when he wrote this, now knowing that he had to go and make this research trip to Salem, um, uh, in part of my process now of, of, uh, of doing this, uh, of digging into the script and mining what, what is there. Um, I, in collaboration with a student dramaturg, uh, dramaturg is responsible for finding research for any play production. Um, his name is Jacob Gerard. I researched the history surrounding the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Um, the, the main resources that I utilized were uh, Miller's own commentary that he has in the one published version of his script as well as uh, a book called The Devil in Massachusetts by Marion Starkey, and a book called The Devil's Shadow by Clifford Lindsay Alderman. What's interesting about um, The Devil in Massachusetts is that it was published in 1949. Um, so it's likely a book that Miller actually picked up and read completely through. You can see a lot of the um, narrative uh, similarities happening in, in what Starkey wrote and what Miller wrote. Um, so in the, in the preface to his play, uh, Miller admits that the play is not entirely historically accurate. He has made alterations to suit dramatic purposes. Um, but he intended to get at the essential nature of this strange, mysterious, and tragic event. Um, uh, the, the main difference is that he, he needed to, so that he didn't have 50 people on stage, he combined a lot of the judges into just two judges. And then to create the personal problem between Proctor and Elizabeth, he had to make Proctor much younger. Proctor historically was in his 60s. And uh, he had to make Abigail older. Abigail historically was 11. Um, so she had to be bumped to um, 17. Um, so um, the other historical context for this is that uh, in this nice image that we have here, uh, associated with the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Puritan settlers that, that uh, lived there. Mostly um, English Protestants, mostly Puritans, that had come there um, to escape um, religious persecution in England. Um, they, um, they sought to establish their own society in the New World. Um, they intended to be a light to the rest of the world for godly living. They wanted to make a new Jerusalem. Um, uh, a line from Miller's commentary that I think is, is really important is that he says, for good purposes, uh, the people of Salem developed a theocracy, a combine of state and religious power, whose function was to keep the community together to prevent any kind of disunity that might open it to destruction by material or ideological enemies. Um, so in talking about the the atmosphere of fear that was growing in America in the early 1950s, there was a certain atmosphere of fear that was growing in Salem that allowed for these events to happen. Um, so the people in Massachusetts Bay, and specifically in Salem, they were beset on all sides by danger. Um, the winter was especially brutal there. They had not dealt with that kind of climate. Um, farmers had to work hard to produce food and livelihoods for their families in the spring, summer, and fall just to survive the winter. And any time not spent working for survival 
was expected to be spent in prayer. These people, their lives were essentially eat, pray, work. And that was all you did. And if there was something else that you were doing outside of that, um, people took notice and, and people took action against you. Um, to the southeast of the bay uh, and, uh, was the ocean that they had already crossed. So they knew they didn't want to go back to England, although some did. Um, those that wanted to stay, they knew they didn't want to go back. Um, but to the north and the west was a great wilderness. You know, the, most of the North American continent had not yet been explored, um, and they feared the woods. They absolutely feared it, because that's where the Native Americans lived. That's where they came out at, out of at night to, to maraud and to, um, to attack groups of settlers. They were, of course, responding to the fact that people were invading on their land, but it was still a very real fear. These people believed that they had been put here by God to, um, to create a light to the rest of the world. So this heathen threat coming out of the woods um, clearly had to be the work of the devil. They firmly believed that Satan took physical form in this world. And, and any kind of misfortune that happened to them was the result of his action. Um, and they believed that the forest, the wilderness, was basically his, his stronghold. Um, there's a line in the play where Paris says, abominations are done in the forest. This is, that's what they believe. Um, um, uh, Puritans believe that just about Every, just as every good and perfect gift came from God, every misfortune was the work of the devil. So this eventually gave way to a variety of superstitions about demons, spirits, and witches and wizards. Um, and they often looked to supernatural causes for things like crop failure, infant death, and social disagreement. Um, now, uh, witches had been um, hunted and looked at as this thing to be, um, to not be um, tolerated within society in Europe for centuries. So this is just something that they, that came with them because of, because of their faith. Um, 1692, Salem, was actually divided in between um, two major portions. And I apologize for the map not being so good. Um, but the main part of Salem was Salem Village, right around this area. Um, right about here is where the center of the village was. It's where the meeting house was. It's where Paris lived. Um, most of the other farmers and other people lived in places outside, further up the road, one way or the other, or up into these roads. Um, but this was Salem Village. This was where all the central gathering place for most of the rural um, citizens of Salem Village. Salem Town was way down here. Um, and Salem Town was inhabited by the wealthier merchant class. Um, there were often land disputes between, both within the people that lived in the village and people that lived within the town, but also between the two of them. Um, there was, for years and years and years, the there were debates about who owned what land, who could have their cows grazed in what pasture, um, who would be allowed to go to church where. Eventually, the people of Salem Village decided to hire their own um, minister. And so they set up a meeting house there in Salem Village, as opposed to going all the way down to Salem Town to go to church, which would have been a much longer trek. Um, but, um, so once they decided to have this pastor, this just caused more problems because they kept arguing about what the pastor should do. They ran out four different ministers before they finally got to a man named Samuel Paris. And um, Samuel Paris didn't make things any better either because um, he was a man who had basically spent his entire life failing at every endeavor he ever attempted. He started at Harvard College um, there in Massachusetts, um, didn't finish. He, um, 
his family owned a business in the Barbados, a sugar plantation. When it was his time to go run it, it failed. Um, and so as soon as it failed, he came back up to Massachusetts with the idea of preaching for a living. It was the one thing that he was kind of, sort of good at, but there was even disagreement in Salem about whether or not that was true. Some people thought he was a good preacher and some didn't. Um, apparently, he didn't make things any better because he was fond of publicly humiliating um, many of the, the citizens for the <laughs> smallest infractions, like small little things, not coming to church one day, even if you're sick and you have a good legitimate reason, he would still publicly criticize you for it. Um, add on top of this that there have been rumors of witchcraft in the towns neighboring Salem for a couple of years leading up to 1692. Um, there was a respected Boston minister named Cotton Mather who had published a book in 1689 detailing how he witnessed what he called the disease of astonishment in four young children um, having fits brought on by evil spells cast by a woman that the children had stolen linens from. Um, symptoms included neck and back pain, tongues drawn from their throats, loud outcries, and loss of body control flapping arms like birds and trying to harm others and themselves. Um, these symptoms quickly became associated with witchcraft. Then it happened too often, it was just this one event for the, uh, what was the, the Goodwin family, the Goodwin children, and what Mather um, witnessed. But he published a book about it, and nothing more came of it until in 1692 in Salem. Um, in the early months of that year, Reverend Paris' daughter, Betty Paris, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail, who was 11, um, they began having fits, similar to what was reported by Matter. Um, though Paris tried to keep the behavior private, word eventually spread through the village. And as it spread, what was interesting was that more and more young girls began to have the same kinds of fits. Um, in the presence of other people, they would fall to the floor, they would convulse, they would, they would cry out, um, they, would, uh, they would say that they were being pinched, poked, prodded. Um, um, so the, the, the girls that were doing this um, became uh, famous for being these uh, girls eventually that would call out witches, Mary Walcott, Susanna Sheldon, Ann Putnam Jr., Mercy Lewis, and others. Um, after being prayed over by a group of area ministers to no relief, it was decided that the cause must be witchcraft and the girls would have to be convinced to reveal their tormentors. Um, the aunt of one of the girls decided that it would be a good idea to use a little bit of white magic in order to get them to do it um, by having uh, one of Paris's slaves create something called witch cake, which was a combination of rye meal and the girl's urine. Yeah. So they had the slave made this cake, and then they fed it to the dog. And the idea was there would be particles left over from the witch's spirit when they affl afflicted the girls that would still be in the urine, and when the dog ate it, it would hurt the witch, and the witch would cry out in pain. Of course, this didn't happen, but when Paris found out about it, he, um, he publicly shamed the woman, and he, um, he made a very forceful punishment of the slave that had done it. And through this, eventually, Betty Paris, um, the young daughter, um, made the accusation that the slave, Tichiba, had, was the one that was um, bewitching them. Um, so once that happened, they named Tichiba, and they named two other women that somehow conveniently had come up over the course of the questioning um, by the adults, um, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. Um, 
there are a variety of theories um, explaining the girl's behavior, um, including uh, ergot poisoning from eating moldy rye bread, um, the fungus being a natural substance from which LSD is derived. So there's a thought that that could have contributed to it. Although there are some people that disagree with that theory simply because the girls seem to have the fits only when other people were around. Um, some of the girls, um, or some believe that the girls succumb to hysteria from the strict pressure of the Puritan life and the dangers of Indian attacks. Um, still others believe that the fits were motivated by jealousy or for a need for attention. Can you imagine being an adolescent in that culture? And what that would, the kind of pressure and strictness that is expected of you. The, the fits basically gave them um, an excuse to behave in a way that any adolescent might want to act in such a, uh, in such a repressed culture. They got to do whatever they wanted, essentially. How freeing would that be? Um, the fact that we don't really know why they did it. Um, is the most intriguing thing. And the hysteria of the adults is what made it so tragic, the fact that they then believed it and took the actions that they did. Um, as more and more women were, uh, especially women, some men were accused, but as more and more people were accused, um, the central government um, established the court of Oyer and Terminer um, in Salem town. Um, to hear and pass judgment on the people accused. Um, by the time this court was dissolved, um, 19 people had been executed as witches or wizards. One was pressed to death for not answering his indictment. Eight more had been condemned to hang, although they were pardoned after. Um, 50 people had confessed to witchcraft to avoid execution. Uh, over 150 were in jail awaiting their trial, and an additional 200 had still been accused and had not yet been brought into the jails or to trial. Those numbers are staggering to me. How large was Salem? Um, uh, I didn't come with that figure. <laughs> um, the the dramatur my, my dramaturg found that number, and now I don't remember. I want to say it was something in the ballpark of, of um, uh, 5 to 10,000, something like that. Um, I have to go and find that again. Um, so now, analyzing the play, reading it over and over, and understanding the context of the witch trials and the HUAC hearings, it became clear to me that the play was about the power of fear. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll just, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, um, the tragic events in both timelines arose out of an atmosphere of paranoia, a fear of an outside enemy, or a punishment, a judgment, the revelation of a secret, or the loss of status. Um, this fear that motivates lies and enables the killing of innocents. And because our antagonist is this atmosphere of fear and a false power built on lies, our protagonist must needs be the courage to stand up and tell the truth, even when that carries its own set of fears. So in my work as a director, I, I, I have to ask some kind of essential questions to help guide the story throughout all steps of the process. What is the play about? What is its spine? What is its central idea? For me, it is fear. Very, very simple, because it takes on so many different forms in the play. Um, what are its major themes, its big ideas surrounding that? Truth and deception, repression, hysteria, vengeance, and goodness. There's a strong theme of goodness and what it means to be good. Um, the final line of the play is Elizabeth saying uh, he has his goodness now. Um, uh, I forget. I'll go on before this. So who has um, not actually seen the production yet? 
uh, and is interested in seeing it. Okay, I'll try not to give too much away about it. I came thinking that more of you would have seen it, but that, that's fine. <laughs> um, you, I'm sure you are familiar with the play, and you probably know how it ends anyway. Um, but, um, so aside from that, um, these big ideas, knowing what it is that, uh, that we're going to be dealing with, uh, wrestling with. I know these are things that I'm going to want to bring to my actors. I also have to think about then each character in the play. What is it that they want? Um, one of the central um, facets of our, of our actor training is the idea that an actor as a character is always pursuing an objective. You always have something that you want. Um, think about yourself and your own personal life. Although we're, we're usually going about our days, not really thinking about it too much, there is usually something very, very central to us that is most important to us that we want. Um, these people in a play, characters in a play, are always, li pardon me, are always living at the most crucial, critical, dangerous point of their lives. And so their stakes are way up here. What they want has to be way up here. Their need for what they want has to be way up here. Um, so I have to go through and look at each character in the play. What is it that they're after? And then what are the given circumstances? Given circumstances is an actor vocab word for anything, any little bit of information that the playwright gives us about what this world is and who the character is. What is their role in it? What are the relationships between people? What time of day is it? Any little fact is considered a given circumstance, and the actors have to remain true to them. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I uh, spent most of uh, the summer and the first part of the fall semester doing this kind of analysis work. And then um, even before um, my production meetings for the show started, I got approached by um, um, the, the design team uh, that is responsible for making the posters uh, for publicity. Um, and so I, I, I had to start talking to the designer for these posters right away, even before we knew exactly what the production was going to look like. Um, but I'd already done this analysis work, and I already knew what it was that I was interested in seeing. Um, and so I talked to the designer, Hannah Sandboy, who is a, a, an art major, um, and uh, she, uh, mm -hmm. ah, there it is. I spoke with her about the concept, and I talked about the, the images that were, uh, that were most important to me um, for this. Going forward, I knew that, uh, that the woods were going to be a very important um, image in this. I also knew that the, the symbolism of power and the shifting of power between a very um, uh, male-dominated society that the Puritans were and the fact that these were now little girls that had power over people, the shift of that power and the fact that even still the men had influence over them um, was something that I was, I was very interested in. Um, so as you see over here, uh, from those discussions that I had with, the, with Hannah, um, she came up with several sketches, ideas, um, different things um, that the poster could have been. Um, so we talked about all these ideas, and over the course of the semester, re really leading all the way up to December, um, we had conversations about, about these different ideas and what we liked. Eventually, we, we settled on using this one, um, and we have this silhouette. This is the final uh, product of the poster that you, all, you guys have had and, and been showing, thank you, um, of the silhouette of the hand and the grip and seeing the woods in the background. Um, so this was a new experience for me. I had never been uh, involved in, in designing a poster before, and it, I was actually really uh, excited about it. I, I think that... Um, our art department is, is very good at what it does, and its students are, are just as good at what they do as ours are at what they do. Um, so I, I was very excited when, when this was finished in December, and I could uh, have it on my phone and show it to my family. Um, I was proud. Um, you can go ahead. Um, so uh, 
poster meetings came first, but uh, then it actually came time to start meeting with our production team, our design team, to talk about what the show is going to look and feel like. Um, this is the entirety of our production team. Um, as you can see, it is mostly students. There are four faculty members that were involved in the, in the production team, but the vast majority of them are students. I had an assistant director uh, who was a BA student. Um, Jacob Gerard was our dramaturg. He was also a BA student. Um, Jacqueline Joslin, stage manager. Nothing in a, in a play, in a production, gets done without a stage manager, without a good stage manager. And Jacqueline was awesome. Um, and her assistants were Maddie and Jenna. Um, our scenic designer was a um, senior BFA design tech student, Emily Kaufman. Um, we'll show you pictures of what it is that she's designed. Those of you that have seen the, the, the show, everything in that visual world, she designed. And to me, that, that a student, an undergraduate student, gets that opportunity in, is, is, is incredible. Um, Ashley Stock was our lighting designer. She was a student. Um, Christina Newby with properties design. Um, sound design, Brandon Mix, also a senior. And then uh, the various assistants for all of these designs um, are all students as well. I think it's really, really great that all of the design um, students get the experience both of assisting other people and having an assistant. So they learn how to lead other people in this process, which is really wonderful. And then, of course, our one design element that was led by a faculty member was costume design. Um, Sandy Childers um, came into the department at the same time that I did, and she's a wonderful costume designer. Um, and then Greg A. Gary Olson and Scott Words Olson um, were there mentoring us the whole way. Um, they were there to mentor the student designers as well as offer um, their wealth of experience. Gary is the chair of our department. He's been there 29 years. Um, he, I, I don't think there's anything that he doesn't know about making theater. Um, and then Scott Wirtz Olson is our brand new technical director. We finally have a full-time technical director position. So he's responsible for making sure that the scene shop runs efficiently. And he's responsible for making sure that everything gets built and everything is safe. Um, and uh, he's been an absolute asset to the department since he came on at the beginning of this year. Um, so this is the team. We started having meetings in, um, in October. And the very first meeting that we have is what is called a concept meeting. And that meeting is basically a time where I talk to them about how I see the show so that they can go back and then think about it and see, OK, how, is it, how do I see the show? And how does it relate to how the director sees the show? Where are there similarities? Where are there differences? How can we develop something together? Right? Anyway, OK, so the concept meeting was, I shared my idea, my vision for the play, about it being about the power of fear. Um, I wanted the environment that we created. It should reflect how the Puritan society was beset on all sides by danger and at the edge of the wilderness and how the woods represented the devil's playground and everything that they feared and were trying to protect themselves from. I wanted that environment to be encroaching onto the action and influencing the action that was happening on stage, creating this kind of suffocating, paranoid atmosphere. Um, so for scenic elements, I was interested in seeing uh, trees and the forest. Um, I was interested in seeing how we could create the architecture of these indoor spaces. Um, that was specific to colonial Massachusetts without having walls. I didn't, want, I didn't want to have to deal with walls. I wanted to be able to see the outside environment. Um, and what Emily came up with, I, I think, was awesome at achieving that. Um, lighting, uh, it was really, really important that we show the time of day. At least three of the scenes are very specific about being um, taking place at dawn or taking place at dusk. Um, and the, the transition of the sun coming up or the sun coming down has a very profound effect on mood and feel. And, and I wanted that to be very uh, felt very strongly um, in the world. Um, I, I was interested in seeing how we could deal with high contrast and the interaction between light and shadow. Um, because as we all know, 
truth can hide in the dark, but it's exposed in the light. Right? Um, costumes, of course, uh, I wanted it to be period appropriate. I wanted to be, them to be from the um, late 17th century Puritan colonial dress. Um, and the main thing that I was interested in in sound, uh, along from the different um, sound effects that were going to be needed for the show, I was interested in hearing um, the songs that were sung um, by the Puritans. There's a specific part of the play that calls for hearing them singing a song off stage, and I was interested in, in how that could be a running theme throughout the show. Um, so, um, uh, the thing that I was going to, I don't know if we'll have time to actually do all this now. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to show you is, um, so then over the course of the fall, the designers go back and they, they do research. They find a bunch of images and they decide uh, what exactly their designs are going to be. Uh, they eventually take the form of renderings or ground plans. These are all images that our scenic designer Emily Kaufman came up with. These are ground plans. This is a bird's eye view of looking down on the stage. This is the edge of the stage. This is where all the furniture would be for the individual scenes. This was her plan for how the floor was going to look, this hardwood floor, having these trees back here in the background, um, of having uh, a collection over here, having a little bit more sparse here in the... You gonna come back? <laughs> come back, please. Oh, gosh. Okay. What's that? So having, being able to see this hill here in the background, which we wanted to be understood as Gallows Hill, where the, the accused and the condemned were taken to be hanged. Um, um, so these were all images that, that we came up with and agreed upon. It's important early on that the director and the uh, scenic designer establish ground plans. It's really important that I know where the furniture is going to be so I know where the actors can walk. Um, good. Um, 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 um. Um, the other thing I was going to show you, so costume design, um, our faculty member Sandy Childers, um, she did a ton of research, she's very good at what she does, and she eventually came up with uh, these color renderings for how the costumes were going to look. We had discussions about each of the individual characters, what kinds of people they were, how their dress reflects their character. Um, and so these were all the initial, uh, or her initial ideas about how these characters should be designed. Over the course of actually building and pulling costumes, changes have to be made. Um, because either uh, the, um, the actor that we cast is a little bit different than what we had expected, or we can't get this type of fabric. This type of fabric that I thought was going to look good doesn't really look that good under light all kinds of problems like that. Um, so we deal with those as we come. Tichiba, um, you can tell, we had planned early on on Tichiba being a woman. Those of you that have seen it know that we had a man play Tichiba. So that was something that she had to change midway through the process, <laughs> dressing a man instead of a woman. Um, OK. Um, of other things. Um, so all, uh, all during the fall semester then we're having to finalize the designs for lighting. Um, our lighting designer found uh, inspiration from luminous paintings and uh, the, the kind of color palette that brings in order to create sunrise and sunset um, uh, fields. Um, Props and sound, um, basically their job during this is making a list of everything that they need, all of the hand props that we need, um, making sure that they're going to look period appropriate. Um, we're actually using materials that look right for the time. Um, and then sound, a list of all the sounds that we are going to need to find or make. And we wound up making a lot of them. Um, so, now. Um, maybe, yes, no, oh, oh, time, wasting time, oh, come on, man, oh, come on, uh, 
go back. Here we go. All right. Come on. Yeah, okay. All right, so finally, at the end of the fall semester, we actually get to the part where I, I do even more of the work. I have to cast the show. These are the people that I'm going to be working most closely with, the actors. Um, Sunday, December 8th was when we had our cattle call auditions. All of the BFA acting and musical theater majors are required <laughs> by their degree track to audition. They're required to audition each semester for the main stage shows. Um, and they are required to accept roles as cast which um, is something that I never had uh, in any of my uh, schooling. Um, if, if you didn't want to accept a role, you, you had the possibility of saying, no, I don't want to do that. These students technically don't. They don't have that option. Um, but anyway, they are all required. Um, any student in the university is allowed to uh, come in and audition. Typically, they don't tend to be cast simply because they are competing against students that we have identified as being highly talented individuals. Um, but it does happen every now and again. Um, so the day right after we have the cattle call audition, which is basically that they come prepared with a monologue and a song because they're auditioning for my show and they're auditioning for the spring musical next to normal. Um, so they just line up one after another and they do their audition and walk off. And I'm looking at them making notes about, okay, did they do the audition well? Um, is there a part that they look right for? Is there a part that they feel right for? I asked them to give a monologue from um, something earlier than 1980. Um, so it wasn't too contemporary. It wasn't going to feel like you know, 2014. Um, it would have felt at least something closer to the period of when Miller was writing or when Tennessee Williams was writing. Um, so uh, they did that. I'm taking notes about that because the very next day, I have them come back for callback auditions. Um, I have set certain scenes that I want to see. Um, uh, I try to see every single character, and I want to see a number of people for each character. And I had to completely graph out, map out the most efficient way to do that. And in a cast of 21, that was a little difficult. Um, I wish now that I, I hadn't called back quite so many people for each role. Um, the fewest number I called back for a character I think was like three, but the most I called back for any given character was like six or seven. And I did that for way too many of the characters. Um, but we did get through it, and I'm told that my callback audition went shorter than several of the other directors, so I feel okay about that. Um, but callback auditions, I'm looking for who is going to fit this role best. Who is it? I'm really looking for who has the best understanding in their own heart about what it is that the character wants. Who has the best idea about it initially. All actors, when they come into a play for the first time, uh, in, into any production once they get the job, it's a process of finding the character and what the character wants. But we all have kind of that instinctual understanding of of what it is that a character wants as actors. And I'm looking for the person that seems to feel that understanding most immediately. So I don't have to do quite so much work with them. It, it'll just come easier to them. Um, it's said that 80% um, of a director's job is casting. And once you've done that, the vast majority of your work is done. Um, so after we had the callback auditions, I spent the week uh, uh, negotiating with the other director, Tyler Marchant, for the musical. Um, I didn't get my first choice of cast. It doesn't matter because I wound up having a wonderful cast that was great. The, it, it just happens, it always happens that the, the students that do the best, that get the best auditions, are the ones that everyone wants <laughs> in a given semester. Um, but we had our negotiation. Um, and then the rest of the faculty have to be notified about your intent to, to cast people, just in case that there are any issues. The nature of our BFA um, performance degree tracks is such that students can be put on probation and dismissed from the program for a few good reasons, either for um, disciplinary reasons, academic 
or artistic reasons. And in any given semester, if they go on probation, they are not allowed to be in a main stage show. That is not, that's not a punishment. It's intended to make sure that they focus on their classwork. Um, we are identifying areas in you that you need to work on. Spend the semester working on them. Um, but anyway, so that discussion has to be had, and that discussion was had. There were a couple of students that I wanted to cast that were actually going to be ineligible for working in a main stage show. And so I had to adjust the cast accordingly. Um, not something I anticipated running into. Mm -hmm. And I did. Um, but once that was all approved, the cast list was posted on Tuesday, December 17th, right in the middle of finals. <laughs> so all of the students are sitting on pins and needles waiting for you know, who's going to be cast, who's going to be cast. And they're having to focus on their, their tests. It's, it's not good. I wish I hadn't done that. I, I apologize to them. Um, but that went up. So they knew before they left for winter break uh, whether or not they were cast. Rehearsals were going to start Sunday, January 19th. Um, this is 7.30 almost. Do we want to? Because I've still got more. Uh, it's up to you guys. Would open up to questions? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. Please. Do people have questions? Please, don't be shy. Or comments? Yes. But well, with part of your time in preparation, did you look at the title? To me, the crucible is everyone should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, what the title means is absolutely one of the essential questions that a director asks. So we know that a crucible is a melting pot for, for testing metals. Um, there's a line um, in, in, the, in the second act, Danforth says, we burn a hot fire here. It melts down all concealment. Yeah, I couldn't remember that was So there is, there's a certain element of believing that the court itself is a crucible, that it is melting down, trying to find the truth. It is also the understanding that the entirety of this situation, this atmosphere of fear, is bringing everyone to a boiling point and is testing their character. It's a true test of John Proctor's character by the end of it. What is he willing to do? Yes, sir. Karen, this was the very first full-scale production you directed. I understand yes. right on that? Yes. After the casting was over and you got underway with rehearsals, down to the production, which is now there, could you share with us what was the greatest single unanticipated challenge that came up. <laughs> the greatest single unanticipated <laughs> challenge that came up. Um, really the greatest challenge was the fact that right in tech week, so we have the weekend before opening um, our technical rehearsals. So we start adding on the technical elements like uh, lights, sound, and then we have dress rehearsals. That week, Half the cast came down with bronchitis. <laughs> they, either came, they either came down with bronchitis or some weird viral infection that caused post-nasal drip and kind of messed up their voices a little bit. I wound up getting it. I'm just now getting over it. Um, but what's amazing to me, so I freaked out about that. We had, a, we had one actor, um, you might have been able to tell it, it is still kind of affecting his speech a little bit he wound up having some kind of infection on his tonsils. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so um, they, they had to do, they had to actually drain pus out of his tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was in a lot of pain, but he, he was a trooper. He spoke through that and uh, he, you know, he kept going. And um, so my hat's off to him for that. Um, but yeah, suddenly dealing with illness in a cast <laughs> is, is a challenge. Yes. That, brings, that brings up the question, do you double cast? And if you do double cast, how many characters would you typically double cast? So I, this is a situation where I did not. I did not hire any understudies. My, my, um, my thought process was halfway through it. Oh, I didn't really hire anyone in case we need to. <laughs> what am I going to do? I guess I could do any of the male roles. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do about female roles. <laughs> um, the, uh, 
I probably would have had um, either my assistant director or um, the, one of the stage managers do it if they were willing. Otherwise, there has been precedence for in shows here at the university to need to recast in emergency situations if something comes up, if an illness or a, an injury comes up, um, uh, asking another person to come and learn the role as quickly as possible. Um, I remember uh, when I was in Arkansas, uh, there was a cast member at a Theater Square production that had, that had suffered a, a personal tragedy while the, um, the show had already opened, and so they needed uh, actors to come and shadow him to learn the part. Um, I wound up not having to do the production, but I spent a day shadowing him, learning the, the role. Um, in the professional world, that's, that's what happens. And it's a, skill that's, it's a skill that's really important for the actors to learn, to be able to learn something quick. Because if they can nail that, they will get hired over and over and over again. Because it's, it's that necessary. Yes? Uh, what kind of budget did you have to work with? I asked them about budget once, and they were like, hey, you don't even know. <laughs> um, so I, I, I just kept working with the assumption that, uh, that we weren't doing anything that was crazy, that was going to be over budget. Our technical director, Scott, just kept assuring me, no, this sounds fine. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not particularly good with numbers. Uh, my wife will attest that I was a treasurer for our junior class. And, uh, I never knew a single thing about our money situation. Um, I, I leave that to Gary and Scott. Yes? Uh, it struck me when I was watching the, the show that the costumes of certain characters were black and white mm -hmm. and no shades of gray mm -hmm. and that these were some of the more, in my opinion, despicable characters <laughs> and that um, No, it, no, it is mostly intentional. The, the thing about um, the characters that were wearing black especially, it was just something that uh, was true of the time period. Black was a very, very difficult color to maintain in, in, in clothing at the time. It was very expensive to upkeep, it faded quickly. So really the only people that could do that were the wealthy. Um, so that included uh, judges, the magistrates, um, uh, Hawthorne and, and, uh, and uh, Danforth. Um, Paris was, uh, although he was a pastor and he, he claims, talks about not being used to this poverty, he is the kind of man that desires that higher status. And so he wants to put on that image. He, he uh, Proctor talks about how he preached nothing but golden candlesticks for 20 week until he had them. That he, he, he likes the finer things in life. And um, while in Puritan society that was considered to be um, excessive, um, it, it happened. And there were people that, that got away with it. Yes? I got two questions. One is, you, were you, you sounded to me as if you were very, very busy with this whole process, I'll call. Were you teaching a class as well? Three. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the normal load for uh, full-time faculty at the university every semester, uh, four classes, four and four each semester. And um, <coughs> so normally when I'm not directing, that's, that's what I do. We get a release from one course to direct. Um, <laughs> the, the directing is still much more than that one class would have been, but um, it, it is appreciated. Yeah. Um, so, so what do your students, once they get that BFA, what kind of work do they get? Are they likely to get? Um, so we, we've designed the BFA performance tracks, especially as pre-professional degrees. We are preparing them to compete in the marketplace as actors. They, most of them want to move to a major market like New York or Chicago, Los Angeles, and start working. Um, 
just start auditioning over and over and over again and trying to get an agent and how the business works. Um, in their final semester, our seniors right now are taking a class called Senior Showcase, where they spend the year, talk, or not the year, the semester, talking about what it's like to transition into that world. They talk about taxes, they talk about um, how to find somewhere to live, how to find a survival job. They talk about all those things and then they actually spend a couple of days during finals week in New York um, auditioning for casting directors and agents. Um, it, not necessarily with the intent of having a career, suddenly being made a star out of that, although if that were to happen, we're not gonna <laughs> you know, we're not going to say, no, you can't do that. Um, but the idea is so that they feel like once they leave college, they can compete. And that's all a theater training program can give you, really, if they're promising you anything more. No. Um, if a student came to you and said that they were really interested in film or television, would you steer them to another university, or do you have something that can address that? No. Um, so we, the vast majority of the curriculum is absolutely focused on theater acting. Um, there is one course in our curriculum that is required of the BFA uh, actors in acting for the camera. Um, our, our program coordinator, um, Steve Trevelyan Smith, um, is, uh, has been an actor for many years. He acted on Broadway, um, and he's acted in television and film as well. And so that's something that he, um, he it's a skill set that he wants to give them as well. Um, it's clearly not a focus of our, of our program, but it's a skill set that we, we want them to have. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, I can't remember who it is, it's gonna bug me, um, but they said that, um, um, Film makes you famous, television makes you rich, theater makes you good. <laughs> so that's why we strongly believe in creating theater artists. And then you can go and, if you really want to pursue film as an art form, which is a totally legitimate art form in and of itself, move to LA after.